Someone want to grab a bucket? This is probably the biggest, healthiest population of endangered California tiger salamanders left. Most of the, the important ecology that we've learned about, that we use for protecting these animals, has come from Jepson Prairie over the last 15 years. Jepson Prairie in the Central Valley is one of the salamanders' last remaining holdouts. Luckily, this site is protected as part of the University of California's Natural Reserve System which serves as a library of carefully managed ecosystems around the state. The environmental legacy of the natural reserve system is really um, a, a big part about getting the science for endangered species so that we can protect California's biodiversity. We have nine right there, and then we go... The one that we At reserves, students and scientists study plants and animals in their native habitats. Yeah. The findings help safeguard California's most vulnerable species, such as these young and endangered tiger salamanders. I mean, just imagine trying to learn where out here the animals live so that you can protect them, and they're only up on the surface when it's pouring rain in the middle of the night. We've done a lot of the work that's allowed people to say, okay, well, how much land do you need to protect, right, for the, to keep a population intact? How big a pool do you need? All that kind of work. Very basic, but very important if you want to protect it. And pretty much all of that work has been generated from here. Oh! <laughs> so this is a larval tiger salamander. They grow like crazy in this larval stage. They get really big, really fat. You can see how chubby the salamander is if you look at it. From the oh, top, I, I, I. you can see its little belly is sticking out because it's all full of those endangered tadpole shrimp and other crustaceans that it's feeding on. They will metamorphose. And when they do that, these gills here, that's what they breathe through is their gills. They wave them by their head. They'll lose those gills. Right now, they don't have eyelids. They'll develop eyelids, these little tiny legs will get huge and so they can walk around. They'll need those legs to flee the lake by summer. That pond's gonna dry up. It's gonna yeah. be dry as can be. That clay in the bottom of it is gonna turn into concrete. They gotta get out of there. These are amphibians. They lose a lot of water through their skin and if they're out in the sun for any amount of time at all, they dry up and die. But until Brad and his colleagues began their study, no one knew where the salamanders went after leaving the water. We had these fences that would catch salamanders and intercept them. We would come out every morning for 10 years, see what salamanders we got, and learn, therefore, where they were on the landscape. So okay. they'll go a mile away from the lake um, to find a place to spend the, the summer and most of their days. And they pick a night, and it's not raining, and they take off and they've got until about seven in the morning when the sun gets warm. The young salamanders are on a desperate hunt for an underground refuge dug by one of their grassland neighbors. So they need gophers, they need ground squirrels, they need animals that make a burrow for them. And if they haven't found a burrow by then that they can live in for the next, you know, five months, it's game over. If these youngsters survive the next five years or so, they'll return to the lake on a rainy winter night. In the waters of the state's largest vernal lake, they'll meet a mate, lay their eggs, and begin a new generation. The average person spends about the same fraction of their year in the shower as a tiger salamander spends in a pond. You can't just protect the pond. You've got to protect the grasslands around it as well. And so you need to know how far they go. You need to know how many go, what kinds of distances, all that kind of stuff. And so we've slowly, over the course of a couple of decades, figured that out. Thanks to years of meticulous research by Brad Schaefer and other scientists, still endangered California tiger salamanders have a much improved chance to survive the perils of the 21st century. Research within the natural reserve system has also helped a long list of other rare and threatened species throughout California. 
At Santa Cruz Island Reserve, scientists discovered that feral pigs, golden eagles, and the pesticide DDT posed a lethal threat to the native island fox. Restoration work based on those findings has lifted the little fox off the endangered species list. Genetics research on California newts at Stunt Ranch Santa Monica Mountains Reserve will guide the conservation of the animal's dwindling Southern California population. Coal Oil Point Reserve near Santa Barbara sets aside prime beach for a nesting colony of threatened western snowy plovers and rescues their orphan chicks. The endangered Stevens kangaroo rat is monitored at Mott Rimrock Reserve located in western Riverside County, where Professor Mary Price of UC Riverside worked out much of what is known about the species. And wildlife biologists keeping track of other vulnerable species, such as the California condor, Coachella Valley fringe-toed lizard, and bighorn sheep, all depend on the preserved environments of the University of California's natural reserve system to advance important scientific research and rescue some of California's most ancient and beloved natural treasures perched precariously at the edge of extinction. If you go across all of the natural reserves, we have in Northern California and Southern California research scientists, most of them are UC professors who have done decades-long work because they can work in protected areas that allow them to uh, follow the biology and the ecosystem dynamics of these rare and endangered species. So we're really proud of that. It's, it's a, an extraordinary environmental legacy.